Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Rick and Morty Season 7, Episode 1, How Poopy Got His Poop Back. A profoundly titled episode, but a nod to how Stella got her groove back. It's a solid season premiere, I gotta say. Great jokes, awesome callbacks, clever animation bits, Easter eggs, and a full tribute to Hugh Jackman and his career. I am gonna break down a ton of details that you might have missed in this episode. Okay, this season now features Ian Cardoni as Rick Sanchez and Harry Belden as Morty Smith, and I really got a hand to them and to the casting team because I gotta admit I often forgot while watching this that these were new actors voicing the parts. I at least found the transition to be pretty seamless aside for a few moments but I think a lot of that is really in our mind and I'm gonna break down why. You're welcome to disagree with me this is just really my take on why we should just be okay with this. The episode opens with the Smith family including Space Beth that's Beth clone who returned as regular in season six. They complain about their house guest Mr. Poopy Butthole and Jerry complains that he's messing with his TiVo. It's an antique the buttons are fragile. I just love of the idea that the family has an interdimensional cable box, but despite having that technology, Jerry's still using TiVo, technology that really hasn't been a relevant service in the past like five to 10 years, but I guess he just doesn't know how to work the interdimensional cable or isn't allowed to use it. A drug dealer hits him up for cash. Yeah, I prefer the term pharmacist. So do they! <laughs> Solid burn from Beth about pharmacists who have had a mixed track record in this country for overprescribing opioids to addicts. Watch Dope Sick, it'll make you really sad, but it's a very important thing to watch. And this might be something Beth might be particularly sore over as a healthcare provider, at least to horses, who has watched her father suffer from addiction. Mr. Poopy Butthole is in rough shape. We last saw him in the season six finale, the stinger scene, looking jacked as they told us that he was rebounding from his divorce from Amy by getting fit and then promptly breaking his legs by squatting too much weight. Now he's completely relapsed. In the corner, we see custody law for dummies. And when we see a pulled back shot of that cover later, it has white figures tug of warring over a child. So sad and exactly what Mr. Poopy Butthole will do with his kid later this episode. His bathrobe is monogrammed M. I thought it was for Mr. Poopy Butthole. His first name is Wayne though, so maybe this is Morty's bathrobe. He says, Bet you didn't expect to see me in a cold open, huh? Yeah, a bit of a meta nod to the voice cast switches. John Allen now voices Mr. Poopy Butthole. And I think a lot of people might have been surprised to see yet another Royland voice character show up here. Mr. Poopy Butthole references when Beth shot him back in season two's total recall episode. And he finds a new bottle of booze and you can see the frames on the wall in the background are askew. One of them is cracked, presumably from when he chucked the bottle at the wall. After an opening title sequence that probably has some episodes that we're never gonna see. Like there's one where the dance off between Beth and Space Beth in a, a dessert themed kingdom. And another where Rick and Morgan Morty are skiing slash snowboarding on their own tongues, and I like how the movement of the skiing and snowboarding is different when Rick has a poles and Morty doesn't. The swerving is exactly the way you center your gravity on whether you're skiing or snowboarding. Anyway, back to the episode, Rick continues his search for Rick Prime. That's his white whale, his nemesis, who killed his wife and daughter. In Dimension C-137, he spent much of season six hunting this guy down, but he left Morty behind with a robot version of himself in the second half of that season. On the screen, we see the yellow central finite curve. That's a spiral display of the multiverse that was first shown in the season five finale, Rick Mirai Jack. Rick sarcastically says that Morty just missed his showdown with Rick Prime, He's calling it a big sword fight atop the Hoover Dam. He fell and landed on a sharp spike and then whispered, Thank you, like a werewolf. I was asking to be polite. I'm not sure, but there seems to be a reference to the 1992 film Universal Soldier, which has a sequence in the Hoover Dam and ends with Jean-Claude Van Damme impaling Dolph Lundgren on spikes, but there's no respectful werewolf style. Thank you. Now, this is just from my hearing, but Harry Belden is a seamless Morty, but Ian Cardoni seems to be wavering a bit as Rick, but I actually think it's totally fine. It just sounds like that to us. And if you compare his Rick to Justin Roiland's voice in season one and season two, he sounds a lot more like the original core of the character. It's just that we, the viewers, began to hear Rick in recent years as an increasingly grumbly Roiland who would sometimes drink in the ADR booth. I actually highly recommend you read Scott Martyr and Dan Harmon's interview with The Hollywood Reporter about their casting process. Apparently thousands of candidates were narrowed down to hundreds and Ian Cardoni was actually one of the first they heard and marked as having flashes of Rick. Apparently the names of the applicants were completely hidden from Harmon and he said, quote, your ears very quickly get so confused when you're trying to tell the difference between a 9.5 and 9.7 on a does this sound like my friend scale. It's a fascinating article. Again, please read it. So Rick's solution for Mr. Poopy Butthole is to scare him away with a robo ghost. He first creates a sentient robot and uploads business, but unplugs it at 77% so that it'll be unfinished business. But then after killing it, the ghost drops through the floor. <laughs> 
Okay, I need to make gravity part of its finished business and leave floors unfinished. It kind of reminds me of when Morty dropped the lightsaber directly through the floor in the season six finale. Would this ghost just keep going further and further down to the core of the planet? So Rick calls out the intervention format as something that he says has a 10% success rate comedically and clinically. In his eyes, referring to real world interventions, 10% sounds a bit low there, but he's also referring to when interventions have been used as a comedic premise in sitcoms. And I kind of feel like this is Dan Harmon speaking from the writer's room. As many TV shows have had an intervention episode, Episode. But if you think about it, Dan Harmon shows like Community and Rick and Morty typically stage intervention-esque conversations in more active context. So that's really characters confronting each other's behavior in the pursuit of something else. And that's what this episode does. It's not characters all sitting around in a circle. It's characters actively doing something and having that meaningful conversation in the pursuit of that mission. Beth mentions the ghost. And not with a ghost. Ah! Ooh, that, that's interesting. You kind of gave him a little power by mentioning him. Uh, there's a lot of science to unpack about ghosts. Yeah, this seems to adhere both to the afterlife concept of people having second lives so long as people keep them in their memories, but also the Beetlejuice rule, where if you mention his name three times, he appears. This is something Dan Harmon played with in my favorite gag from the series community. Where your study buds will go. What's the blonde's name? Bitter Butter Beetlejuice? This Gwynifer must be real special. Don't you usually wear the stripy turquoise Beetlejuice numbers? There's nothing in your playlist but Spooky Party, the Beetlejuice soundtrack, and NPR podcasts. So Rick puts a crew together for Mr. Poopy Butthole's intervention, including Gearhead, aka Rivolio Clockwork Jr., who has a rack and pinions pinup poster. Next, Squanchy. Squanch! Told you he wasn't dead. We Squanchin'? Yeah, Squanch has made several cameos over the years, like in memories and in flashbacks, since his supposed death in the Wedding Squanchers episode, but apparently this is either being retconned or he's being pulled from another universe. Each time they recruit a new intervener for this, they respond with a, you son of a bitch, type response, like in the heist episode, season four, episode three, one crew over a crew crew's mortar. By the way, if you're interested in my breakdown of that episode, I did break down all of season four on this channel. You can go find that. Next, we visit the home of Bird Person, where we see his daughter with Tammy, Bird Daughter, messing with her phone on the couch, and there's a jacket with what looks like various rebellious patches, anti-federation stuff. There's also a magazine, Beak Talk, and then some frames on the wall of several images of Bird Person with Rick, as well as the band they had with Squanchy, the Flesh Curtains. This video is sponsored by Dungeon Hunter 6, the newest game in the Dungeon Hunter franchise. Dungeon Hunter 6 is a free to play mobile fantasy ARPG with a fast paced hack and slash combat. It rules. It's absolutely free to play. Download it now using the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. If you're viewing on a PC, Dungeon Hunter 6 makes it super fun to tweak your build and skills, get your characters buff enough and you can beat up big bad bosses. But in Dungeon Hunter 6, killing a boss just ramps things up. After you kill a boss, you can ride them around, summon them in a battle, perform combo skills, and eventually even shapeshift into them. With over 100 unique bosses to to conquer, plus new classes and units updated monthly, the possibilities are endless. The skill animations are awesome and combat is super fluid in a way I genuinely did not expect for a mobile game. Plus, it's super fun to play with friends. You build a guild, battle in real time, guild wars, and trade items with the in-game auction system. Download Dungeon Hunter 6 now for free on both Android and iOS by clicking the link in the description or scan the QR code if you're on a PC. Using our link will give you a starter pack worth $50, including 10 summoning scrolls, an accessory pack, and a demonic wolf SSR lieutenant. Once you've got an account, enter Lucky Spin Event for free to win great prizes like iPhone 15 Pro Max, PS5, Apple Watch, and more starting October 13th. Bird person says that he found a severed Grompoline arm and her Federation hit list, so it just seems like Bird daughter rebels both against her father and her mother Tammy with the Federation. And Bird person says that she was imprisoned in a femme fatale training camp, and I don't know what that means, but it sounds crazy. So the next recruit is a Smith's longtime neighbor, Gene, who's mowing his grass, but his riding lawnmower just keeps going on and on and kind of becomes a maximum overdrive scenario where the machines come to life. It pushes a parked car into the street, so it violently kills this motorcyclist, and we'll next see it in the post credit scene. We'll talk about that later. So they take Mr. Poopy Butthole to a restaurant called the f yous. Inside, the bar stools are butts with heart tattoos and slap marks on the cheeks. Over the bar, it reads, the first f is free. A neon sign reads, copyright proof beers. So, you know, the animators wouldn't have to pay licensing fees. A banner reads, you puke, we laugh. There's another banner with someone just puking. There's a sign that says, no black light allowed. Gross. Mr. Poopy Butthole says that he hired a predator as a PI, referring to the Yautja race from the Predator franchise. We see the app on his phone. It's like an old GeoCities style website design with last update 2001, Mr. Poopy Butthole reveals. This is a great place to celebrate my birthday. Birthday, 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 birthday. 
Now, I hate to pull a Simpsons did it because I'm sure the writers of Rick and Morty are well aware of this more than anyone is, and they probably do this intentionally, but this is an amazing Simpsons gag. I hope we'll always be together. 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 But Rick decides to get riggedy riggedy ranked, leading to a montage set to this ska sound. Now, the lyrics come at us really fast, but they're really fun, so I'm gonna spell them out for you here. I take a shot, do a pop, blow a line, huff turpentine, get wrecked, text your ex, fight a cop, feeling fine, punch your dick, turn some tricks, quit your job, buy a dog, have two beers, then ten more, pop a pill, and meet the floor. When Rick opens a portal on the street, I just love that Gene does a cannonball into it. And then they go to the strip club where an octopus and a police officer hat spanks Mr. Pooper Butthole. They do shots of an alien with five belly buttons, but if you count, out, there are only five. There's one for Mr. Poopy Butthole, one for Squanchy, one for Rick, one for Bird Person, one for Gearhead, and then not another one for G. So yeah, he really is drinking out of something else. Then they go to a universe where everyone is a bottle or a can, so they basically drink their innards, which is horrifying. Then they party in the cement mixer party truck with a sloshing liquor in it. Gene asks for a toilet, and there actually is one, but there is a sign over it forbidding pooping in it. Many people have tried that before, I guess. But then when it rotates, all the piss dumps into the booze, which is just so gross, because it means most of this liquor is probably pee. Then they go to a club where honey drips on Rick, which is a reference to the 1998 Blade film where blood drips on the clubber before it just sprays down from the nozzles. This is a bee club. It's not another planet though, it's just the normal universe. And here they meet Hugh Jackman, and Jackman actually voices himself for this episode, which is crazy. Rick says, Makes sense he recognizes me. We both hosted the Oscars. This is a reference to how Dan Harmon and Rob Straub are in contact with Hugh Jackman, I'm thinking. They both were on the writing team when Hugh Jackman hosted the Oscars in 2009. They were part of the group that came up with all the bits for the opening monologue and a musical number, which I will always remember because it has this amazing joke where Hugh Jackman's doing like a musical bit about the reader. I never read the reader. And he's just wearing these like silver jumpsuits because he has no idea what the reader's about. And Rob Traub and Dan Harmon are actually nominated for Emmys for their writing for that. Here we see Hugh Jackman wearing a white tank and jeans, which is his common Wolverine attire. His belt buckle has three claw marks, of course, for the Wolverine scratches. Turns out Hugh actually knows Gene because he married his cousin, meaning Gene's cousin must be Deborah Lee Furness, whom Hugh Jackman was married to from 1996 to this year, they actually just got separated this past September. The Jack Shack is actually full of nods to Hugh Jackman's films. There's the Jackman poster with Hugh Jackman as all the different X-Men, not the other actors in the X-Men movie. Nearby one actually reads Le Jackman's for Hugh Jackman's role in the 2012 Les Miserables film. There's also a nude portrait of Hugh Jackman with his Wolverine claws out. If you look closely, the beer on the table are all Hugh Jackman brands like Jack and something, and it's like an Australian label. There's Hugh's Pale Ale. There's also, we later see the Rick and Morty classic foam brand of beer. Bird Person does the knife through the fingers trick that Bishop does in Aliens. Hugh has a trophy case that includes a fist with three Wolverine claws and then frames over it include a marriage photo that I assume is with Deborah Lee Furness. There's a TV awards photo with The Rock. There's also a framed photo of Hugh with his real life dog Allegra. An exact recreation of this photo. But here in animation they made Allegra look like a brown version of Snuffles aka Snowball. Morty's past dog from season one. Hugh calls the statue at a Tony award but really the Tony statuette is actually a disc that shows the comedy and drama masks. It's not like the masks separated like this. But Hugh Jackman did win a Tony in 2004 for The Boy From Oz and an honorary Tony in 2012. Hugh claims that he, not Billy Ocean, wrote the song Caribbean Queen. Mr. Boo Boo Butthole asks, Does Wolverine hurt a little? Every, Every time. time. Every time. A reference to the line in X-Men when Wolverine told Rogue that his claws hurt every time. Gene says, Amy's coming back, dead or alive. A nod to Robocop's catchphrase, dead or alive, you're coming with me. Now, maybe it's an animation flaw here, but in this shot, Squanchy's leg is a rounded off stump disconnected from his foot. But I do love the continuity with the gash still in his paw. Actually, from here on in the episode, you'll notice it is bandaged. Beck Bennett voices the Robo Ghost. Nick Rutherford wrote this episode, and Nick Rutherford, Beck Bennett, Kyle Mooney, and Dave McCary were all part of a sketch group called Good Neighbor. Gene and Hugh reenact the Say Anything stereo bit with Hugh Jackman singing the lyrics to Billy Ocean's. Caribbean Queen, but Amy's levitating is actually the result of the Predator P.I. cradling her. So Mr. Poopy Butthole kidnaps his son and Rick recommends doing the mud thing, a nod to Schwarzenegger cloaking himself in mud and Predator to hide. The Predator uses his three point laser sight to track them. He really has all of his familiar gear, the retractable spear, the razor sharp net. Squanchy pulls out his tooth to drink a growth formula like he does in Wedding Squanchers, but he throws up from all the crap they've been consuming. The Predator stuffs Gearhead's nuts into his mouth. Oh, 
Why is this my thing? This is a callback to season two, episode two, Morty Night Run, when Rick does the same move to him. Mr. Poopy Bottle references season four, episode three, which was the heist episode one crew over the Kruger's Morty, which shows Mr. Poopy Butthole beating the crap out of all the students in his class. They end up dogpiling on the Predator, and Mr. Poopy Butthole's like, give me that big old tooth. Rick, meanwhile, wants a skull, since the Predator collects skull trophies from its victims, but they're able to make peace, and the Predator gives Mr. Poopy Butthole a musket, but Hugh Jackman returns and knocks him out with a Grammy statuette. The Grammy is for Caribbean Queen, written by Hugh Jackman, age 16, which feels like a totally fake Grammy that he or his new agent maybe made for himself to justify his stupid lie to himself. And for whatever reason, Hugh Jackman covered himself in mud naked. His crotch region is blurred out. So they eat at Taco Tambourine and Bird Person's phone alert is two eagle cries. <laughs> Bird person tells Rick it was canonical to see him, probably not to this bird person's appearance as a solidly canon episode with repercussions for future events. Cause you know, that's not always the case when these characters appear. The episode shifts into Mr. Poopy Butthole's voiceover as each of them fade away, a reference to the epilogue sequence of the Sandlot of all movies to reference, in which the narrator references everyone's features as they dissolve out of the shot. Mr. Poopy Butthole says Hugh went home to glue together the Tony Award that he had broken, which reminds me of the epilogue in my favorite episode of The Office when Jan has to glue together Michael Scott's Dundee Award after she had broken it. And Mr. Poopy Bottle says also to put a bullet in all future Wolverine references thanks to us because yeah, now any future Rick and Morty reference to Wolverine is going to be contextualized by what happened in this episode. Rick reveals that these fades are actually the result of fading pills and he gets ahead of all the uh, social media um, excuse me's by saying that Gearhead's taxi fading was caused by the pill thinking that the taxi was his overcoat. So the episode's post credit scene catches up with the riding lawnmower in a small town sheriff committed to bringing it down. The cinema marquee has what I think are my favorite references this episode. The movies that were playing at this theater were Jan Quattering to Vincent 16. That's from the Interdimensional Cable 2 episode. That was an improvised movie title from Royland starring Jan Michael Vincent. And he just swapped out Michael for Quadrant, so it's Jan Quadrant Vincent 16. The other movie looks like it was Two Brothers Tomato Monster. Of course, the Two Brothers movie from the first Interdimensional Cable episode, Rick's D Minutes. The sheriff stalls by kissing his Celtic cross, his locket, his clover pendant, his Bible with a bullet in it. And then he sings this song. These lyrics are actually from a real Irish ballad called The Hills of Donegal, but the lawnmower just runs him over and in the bloody mess, we see all these four good luck charms along with a button for Guinness World Records Most Superstitious Man. Whew, that is a lot of Easter eggs in this episode with nods to Wolverine, Community, Simpsons, Hugh Jackman's Oscar monologue, Predator, Blade, Aliens, The Sandlot. I feel like this episode was made for me, so I just really loved and appreciated breaking it down and hopefully we'll be able to keep doing these this season. All of the episodes of Rick and Morty season six were broken down for us by Whitney Van Lanningham, who did an incredible job and now she's breaking down new episodes on her channel Whitney Vision so please subscribe and watch her videos there. Please subscribe to New Rockstars, like this video and comment down below with your favorite part of this episode and your general thoughts on where this season's going and I'll see you next time. Bye everybody.